Do you remember the Discovery Channel? For many of us, the Discovery Channel was a classic portion of our childhood. Basically, if you had grown out of the Nickelodeon and Disney phase, you were probably watching the Discovery Channel. They had everything from How It's Made, Gold Rush, Cash Cab, and Deadliest Catch, to Mythbusters, Dirty Jobs, Planet Earth, and Naked and Afraid. They also had random one-off specials like Nick Wallenda crossing the Grand Canyon. Also, who could forget Shark Week? Every year, Shark Week almost felt like a worldwide event like the World Cup or the Olympics. Whether you went to get a haircut or went to Home Depot, you'd probably overhear people talking about Shark Week. But since then, much has changed for the Discovery Channel. For one, many people don't even have regular cable TV or satellite TV. Instead, they simply have a handful of subscriptions like Netflix and Disney+, Plus, along with maybe YouTube Premium. The Discovery Channel did try to ride this new trend by launching their own streaming service called Discovery Plus in late 2020. But this hasn't worked out all that well. Sure, they were able to get about 22 million subscribers, but this is nothing in comparison to their status a decade ago. In 2010, for example, Mythbusters alone pulled in 85.8 million views within just the first 9 months of the year. The Discovery Channel was actually so big that they were their own public company worth as much as $20 billion. But more recently, the Discovery Channel agreed to complete a merger with Warner Media, and this is how their new stock has performed. Their popularity graph isn't much better either. In fact, it's actually worse. Since the 2000s, search volume for the Discovery Channel has literally dropped by 90 to 95%. So, here's the rise and fall of one of the most classic media businesses of our entire generation. Taking a look back, the story of the Discovery Channel dates all the way back to 1982 to a man named John Hendricks. John had a pretty average background. His father owned a local contractor business, while his mother worked as a clerk at the city government. So, like most people, John's obvious career choice was to go to college and get a job. John ended up attending the University of Alabama where he studied history. This was also when John started experimenting with this creative side. You see, while John attended college, he had a part-time job working in the audiovisual department, and this is where he really fell in love with producing documentaries. John felt that quality documentaries were something that the American public severely lacked, but he also wasn't crazy enough to dive straight into the media business. Instead, he got a traditional job at his university after graduation, where he led community and government relations. He would eventually transition to the University of Maryland, where he did the same job, but this time he would also work on an entrepreneurial project. He co-founded a fundraising consulting company that focused on publishing academic newsletters. The company never rose to insane heights, but it looks like it gave John enough confidence to take a gamble with media. So, in 1982, John founded Cable Educational Network, and as you would guess, the company focused on providing documentary programming to cable broadcasters. The big jump forward didn't come till 1985 though, when bigger players also became interested in the space. The BBC was likely the most well-known of these, but they were by no means the only one. These players became investors in a new project led by John called the Discovery Channel. Initially, this was just supposed to be a subsidiary of Cable Educational Network, but as funding grew larger and larger, John would shift his entire focus to the Discovery Channel. Soon enough, he would actually change the name of the parent company to Discovery Communications Inc., and that marked the beginning of the network that we're all familiar with today. At first, the company only broadcast 12 hours a day between 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. to a modest 156,000 households but everything they aired was a banger. 75% of their content had never been seen by an American audience, and much of it covered fascinating educational content. This included cultural documentaries, wildlife documentaries, and science and history specials as well. They even had some Soviet programming. Very early on, they also experimented with Shark Week, which quickly turned into an annual event. Given that Americans couldn't get this content anywhere else, the Discovery Channel exploded in popularity. In fact, within five years of launch, their reach would grow from 156,000 households to 50 million households. 
John had clearly hit a gold mine, and all that was left was to double down and build on this success. At first, the next steps were obvious and clear. Just keep doing exactly what you were doing, but at a larger scale. This meant expanding to an international audience and launching and acquiring new networks, and this is exactly what Discovery did. They expanded to the UK in 1989, and they followed this up with an expansion to Asia and Latin America. Something you may not know about Discovery is that they actually owned a bunch of our other favorite channels as well. This started off with an acquisition of TLC in 1991, and quickly grew to encompass Animal Planet, Planet Green, the Military Channel, and Fit TV. Discovery also ran a number of popular websites including HowStuffWorks.com and TreeHugger.com. While they had their hands in so many different genres and mediums, the core mission of the company always rang true, which was to be the number one non-fiction media company. All of this climaxed in 2001, when the Discovery Channel became the world's most widely distributed television brand. They were even bigger than Netflix's today, reaching 300 million households in over 180 countries. At one point, it was estimated that their cumulative viewers had even crossed 1 billion people per year. They had made it to the absolute top. But this made the following question very difficult to answer. Where do they go from here? Well, the correct answer would have been to just keep doing what they were doing and be happy being a mature media company. But investors nor executives were exactly pleased with just that. They wanted more growth, more viewers, and of course, more money. And given that Discovery had peaked out in the nonfiction market, there was only one way to continue growing, aim for a broader audience. This meant adding in more elements of reality TV and focusing more on the storyline than the actual facts. In the beginning, this actually worked out great. In fact, you could even argue that this is exactly what Discovery was previously missing. While purely non-fictional content was great, this extra element made the content phenomenal and this gave rise to the golden age of Discovery. Shows like Mythbusters, Dirty Jobs, and Deadliest Catch had this perfect mix of non-fiction and fiction. Mythbusters, for example, centered on the scientific process, physics, and engineering. But it wasn't limited to just that. It also had personalities, drama, emotions, and most importantly, people that you could relate with. Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs was likely one of the most down-to-earth people to have ever been on TV. This golden period didn't last forever though. In late 2007, Discovery announced that they were going to go public in 2008. This was terrible timing given that it was during the heart of the Great Recession. And it wasn't that surprising that the IPO didn't go all that well. But this lackluster IPO was just the beginning of Discovery's long and painful descent. Now that Discovery was public, pressure from investors was larger than ever and they were legally obligated to act in the best interest of investors. Discovery was already headed in the direction of adding in too much reality and not enough science, but the IPO simply solidified this trend. The show that most people point to as being the epitome of Discovery's decline is American Chopper. The show focused on a group of people who set out to create the world's most unique motorcycles. While this was indeed an interesting premise, it had virtually nothing to do with science, education, or learning. It was a reality show, a successful one, yes, but was it something that aligned with Discovery's mission? Not at all. While the show garnered a bunch of viewers, it was a completely different demographic. Fortunately, classic Discovery viewers had classic shows to turn back to, right? Well, yes and no. The classic shows were indeed still being produced and aired, but these two were missing something. Shark Week, for example, started receiving a bunch of criticism that it was filled with a bunch of misinformation and blatantly false science. Similarly, Mythbusters was drifting away from science and experiments to action and explosions. We saw fewer clips of Jamie or Grant explaining Newton's laws and more clips of the crew blowing up random crap just for fun. Now, don't get me wrong here. Watching them blow up random crap was quite entertaining in itself, but at the same time, you couldn't deny that the show had somehow lost what made it so great. Soon enough, these shows weren't just losing their souls, but they were getting cancelled. This didn't necessarily mean that the shows were doing bad per se, but they had simply reached their natural ends. 
Dirty Jobs, for example, wrapped up in 2012, while Mythbusters wrapped up in 2016. Usually, there would have been plenty of shows that these viewers could have switched to, but this time, all that was left was the reality crap, and over time, the core Discovery viewers simply tuned out. This downtrend was simply accelerated by macro conditions within the media industry. The trend wasn't to get cable or satellite TV. The trend was to ditch cable and satellite TV. In 2015, 76% of Americans had traditional TV. But by 2021, only 56% of Americans had traditional TV. Meanwhile, platforms like Netflix and Hulu were skyrocketing in popularity. Netflix, for example, has grown from 50 million subscribers to over 200 million subscribers in the last 7 to 8 years. And the worst part about all of this was that the majority of people leaving cable for Netflix was the more generic audience who was interested in the reality shows. Meanwhile, the people that were left behind were the classic Discovery viewers. Yet Discovery was spending all of their efforts chasing after the rapidly shrinking reality audience. And at this point, there was only one way that the story could end. Looking forward, while Discovery is by no means as large as they once used to be, they're still a sizable media organization. I mean, 22 million subscribers is nothing to scoff at. Also, the merger with Warner Media has boosted their total subscribers all the way to over 90 million. With this new catalyst, it seems like it's just a matter of time until the new Discovery is able to rival Netflix and Disney with their 200 million plus subscriber counts. But while Discovery has a solid chance to become a media giant once again, the Discovery that we all knew and loved is still very much dead. The second wave of growth will almost completely be fueled by reality shows like Trixie Motel, 90 Day Fiancé, Alone, and Ghost Adventures. And given the merger with Warner Media, it's unlikely that Discovery will ever return to what we remember it as. They've simply shifted to serving the broader entertainment market, and that's what happened to Discovery. Do you guys prefer the old Discovery or the new Discovery? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you missed the old Discovery. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.